Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee for allowing me to appear here today to discuss the Justice Department's legal views on the federal government's efforts to improve contracting opportunities for women. The Justice Department's view of all gender-based programs rests on a simple premise. These programs, no matter how strong their policy justification, must comply with the Constitution. To do so, these programs must be able to withstand scrutiny under the equal protection component of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. The type of programs addressed in the SBA's proposed rule clearly trigger this equal protection scrutiny because the programs would require federal agencies to grant contracts to some businesses and deny contracts to others on the basis of gender. The practical problem the government faces in administering these programs is determining what exactly this equal protection scrutiny means for the programs. The precise level of equal protection scrutiny that applies to a preference program depends on the type of preference at issue. Preferences such as veterans' preferences that do not involve race or gender are subject to rational basis scrutiny, which means that courts will uphold them as constitutional as long as the government has a rational basis for adopting them. On the other hand, preference programs that do involve race or gender are subject to much higher equal protection scrutiny by the courts. Race-based programs are subject to strict scrutiny, which means the particular program must be narrowly tailored to serve a compelling government interest. In other words, they're highly disfavored. In contrast, gender-based programs are subject to intermediate scrutiny, which the Supreme Court has said is much more demanding than rational basis scrutiny, but different than the strict scrutiny that applies to race-based programs. Justice Ginsburg's opinion for the Supreme Court in the VMI case elaborated on what intermediate scrutiny requires. It requires that the government be able to show, in the court's words, an exceedingly persuasive justification for awarding government benefits on the basis of gender. The reason is that these awards, no matter how well-intentioned, grant or deny government benefits on the basis of gender rather than individual abilities or qualifications. Accordingly, the Supreme Court said that although intermediate scrutiny is different than strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny requires the government to show that a gender-based program furthers important governmental interests and that the gender discrimination the program requires is substantially related to achieving those interests. The Justice Department in reviewing gender programs adheres to the intermediate scrutiny standard the Supreme Court set forth in VMI and looks to how courts have applied this standard to particular types of gender programs. For contracting programs, federal courts have consistently held that to satisfy intermediate scrutiny, the government must show genuine, non-hypothetical evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program will operate. I want to point out again that this standard of intermediate scrutiny and the court's focus in gender cases on the government's ability to prove discrimination does not erase the distinction between strict and intermediate scrutiny. The Eleventh Circuit explained the difference this way. While there is a difference in the evidence required to support a race versus gender based program, the difference is one of degree, not of kind. In both contexts, race and gender, the constitutionality of a government program turns on the adequacy of the government's evidence of discrimination. Intermediate scrutiny just means that in gender cases, less evidence is required. Exactly how much less evidence is not clear from the cases. What is clear is that to survive intermediate scrutiny, a government's gender program must allow the government to show genuine, non-hypothetical evidence of discrimination in the particular field where the program will operate and the cases make clear that mere findings of underrepresentation or disparity are generally not sufficient to satisfy the constitutional standard. The lesson these cases leave for federal agencies implementing gender-based programs is clear. If the agencies want their programs to be upheld as constitutional, the programs must be based on government evidence of discrimination 
in the particular field where the program will operate. That is exactly what the proposed SBA rule requires. It requires that an agency intending to implement a gender-based set-aside program identify as the government evidence of discrimination in the field where the program will operate. It is for that reason that the Justice Department views the proposed rule as consistent with what the Constitution requires under intermediate scrutiny. The rule is also consistent with federal agencies' obligation to implement statutes and programs in a constitutional manner. In, in order to discharge this obligation, federal agencies can and should take steps to maximize the chances that courts will uphold their programs. Doing so not only helps the agencies comply with the Constitution, it also helps ensure that the programs will survive legal challenges that would otherwise prevent those programs from serving the very people they were intended to benefit. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to taking any questions.